Welcome to The Lover's Hole. We are rereading the Aubrey Matron novels of Patrick O'Brien. As usual, you're with Mike. And you're with Ian. As we continue to plunge through Treason's Harbor. Ian, catch us up. Well, Mike, it's been quite the plunge. Things have really taken off in the last couple of chapters. Um, Having had a sermon from Mr. Martin last time, the crew of the Surprise, having been aboard the dromedary, the transport, reached our first destination. We reached the Egyptian desert around the mouth of the Nile. We got a little poetical last time as well as we rode across the desert. Uh, We learned about jinns and ghouls as um, Martin and Stephen were visiting the African desert. We heard the sound of the ghoul, the uh-hoo, uh-hoo, of what turned out to be the eagle owl. The crew have now set off to march across the desert to Suez, where they're on their way, hopefully, to intercept the galley that's carrying the treasure. This time, then, we're going to learn about the desert march. We're going to look for missing Turks. We're going to board another new ship. We're going to board the Niobe. And we're going to find out that despite what Jack says, not all sharks are gammon. And we're going to reinforce once and for all the notion that nearly everything depends on the wind and sometimes on having a pair of urinators aboard. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. Oh, yeah. Well, it's interesting, you know, as you say, you know, we're, we're, we're getting ready to, for this desert march. We're getting ready to read all about these encounters with gins and ghouls and everything. And instead, the chapter opens with a letter from Jack being written to Sophie on board the Niobe. And we're kind of thinking, wait, yeah. wait, what happened on this whole march? What, what was all this stuff you set us up for? And, you know, in true Jane Austen fashion, Jack is now writing to Sophie and recounting all the things that that catches us up here. Uh, He talks about this trip across the desert, how they made excellent speed. You know, they they kind of covered in three days, I believe, what they were going to thought they would take four days. And he said this was not because of any extraordinary zeal on the part of the men, although they are a very decent ship's company, as you know but because a mighty stupid English-speaking Turk in command of our escort had filled their heads with tales of ghouls and genii, and the poor silly fellows hurried forward all night long at a short shuffling trot, all crammed together, each dreading to be left at any distance behind, and all wanting to be very near Burn, the man of the foretop who has a lucky snuff box warranted to preserve the owner from evil spirits and the falling sickness. <laughs> and, and, and Jack recounts it how, you know, every dusk and every dawn, there are all these creatures howling, which sounds like screams of a soul in torment. And, you know, during the daytime while they were resting, there would be mirages that the men all knew were ghouls. And Jack describes one scene of, of them looking at a mirage and it says, that great savage brute Davis. We all remember Davis from the boarding episodes. And Jack adds, a cannibal to my certain knowledge, clinging to the bosun with his eyes tight shut and the bosun clinging to a camel girth and both of them calling out to little Calamy, begging him to tell them what it was all over. Ouch. <laughs> it's really, really funny. Jack is, I think, relishing telling this really funny story um, back to Sophie, he's relishing the fact that some of his men who are prime hands and bold seamen aboard the deck of a ship are a bit all to seek and a bit superstitious uh, and a bit scared, to be quite honest, when they're ashore. It's a shame, though, that this this business of the mighty, stupid English-speaking Turk, that's our Odabashi. And I'm a bit sad that Jack doesn't love the Odabashi quite as much as we do. But meanwhile, we keep going with this theme of, of superstitions. Mr. Martin's been been trying to help, and he, he raises this idea of just superstitions. And Stephen weighs in with biblical tales about witches and evil spirits and classical ghosts. And I've no idea where he gets this from. A Pyrenean werewolf of his acquaintance. And Mike, maybe, maybe this is Stephen being the devil's advocate, as you might say, ho, 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 just keeping the argument going. Or maybe he's getting back at the sailors for all the times they've practiced on him, all the times they've played on his nautical gullibility. So maybe this is a little bit of a bit of revenge for Stephen. But anyhow, Stephen and Martin have spent a huge amount of their time finding plants and looking for creatures and 
Stephen rather wishes that Jack hadn't caught quite so many serpents because seamen are very uneasy around all these serpents. Or, as Jack points out, the monstrous bat, three foot across. He says, it flew from the table and clapped onto poor Killick's chest and I thought he would faint away from mere terror, believing it to be an unclean spirit. As well he might. Oh, my, poor old Killick. And, you know, I'm just dying to see this when they when they make these books all into a, a great series. <laughs> I'm going to see this scene of this huge bat on Killick's chest. Yeah, t- touches a Ridley Scott alien there, I think, somehow. That's right. Oh, well, you know, Killick almost fainted. And Jack says, that in fact, the next day he actually did faint. That, you know, there's some in-season camels kind of, you know, messing with each other and this camel tramples Jack's tent scattering all his belonging kind of digging them into the desert sand there and all these people are helping to work trying to to get the camels off uh figure out you know where all his things have gone but after all their hard work his best hat and chalank were lost they couldn't find them and Killick you know, not to be stopped, would never give it up until he fainted dead away from digging in the desert sand in the midst of this heat all day long. Well, yeah. uh, Jack was amazed that Stephen, who, you know, usually is just completely threadbare and, and doesn't have much, had bought an entire flock of camels of his own to carry all the parts of his diving bell. Um, we get a, a little, uh, you know, a little ominous something. Harabedian, his advisor and translator, had been bitten by a scorpion as he was putting on his boot. So unfortunately, sometimes when Jack needs to talk to the locals, Harabedian's not available here. They arrive at the Suez and they can't find the Turkish soldiers. They they see this kind of uh, mid-level uh, Egyptian authority, the, the kind of the, the lieutenant governor, if you will. You know, he, he isn't telling them much about the Turks. There were some there, believes they've left. Um, Jack really can't make heads or tails of it. And they finally learn, but it's by this time, it's towards the end of Ramadan, that in fact, the Turks had had a, a disagreement with the Egyptian and had moved out to the wells of Moses. But because it's the end of Ramadan and now this great big feast, uh, Jack can't get them to move. He's, you know, he's ready to get on board the Niobe and get out of here. But they're saying, no, no, you know, you've got to attend the feast with us. And then, you know, or maybe we'll go after that. So Jack ends up attending both the Egyptians feast, the local governor, the lieutenant governor there, and the one given by the Turks out at the well of Moses. So he's writing to Sophie about how these huge meals, two in one day in the midst of this heat had sort of done him in here. Yeah, that's kind of like two two Christmas dinners, two Thanksgiving dinners, that must be. Right. For a man of Jack's spirits, I'm pretty sure that that's, that's within the compass of what's doable. But Mike, this, this setback, it, not only have we got this delay grating on Jack, who needs to lose not a minute like he always needs to, and we know that he's fighting against you know making it to the uh, the rendezvous with a galley in time for the end of Ramadan. But we've, we've got things starting to go wrong, all, all, all apparently mediated by animals. <laughs> Right. We've got the, the chalenk, which the admiral himself had said was Jack's big status symbol in Ottoman territory, you know, taken care of by a rampaging camel. We've got our friend Hyrabedian, who we've really got to like. He's he's become a second Jagiello. He's this charming, easygoing guy. He's been bitten by a scorpion. Not very many venomous bites from creatures in Patrick O'Brien's books. <laughs> but here we've already had the scorpion bite. We've had Stephen and Mr. Martin bitten by mosquitoes. We've also, by the way, got the bat on Killick's chest. I think we've got a lot of signals from the animal world that everything's not going to go according to plan. Right, right. This is not going to be easy going for sure. Right. And now, as Jack is continuing to report back to Sophie in his letter, we learn that with Harabedian still unable to travel, Jack is not only stuck with a delay, he's stuck with a communication problem because he can't get his message across to the Turkish commander, this guy, Midhat Bimbashi. Stephen had tried to speak Greek and small amounts of local languages. He couldn't get Hassan or the Bimbashi to understand that they needed to leave right away. Hassan is the Egyptian Arab who's being sent in to replace the sheikh in Mubarak. So he's the key diplomatic passenger that Stephen and Jack have got to take along with them. So Jack and Stephen are trying to make this point that they need to hurry, and they just laugh when Stephen 
tries to act out the the power of the wind, he accidentally blows in and puts out the hookah that they're smoking. And Stephen responds, Zut alors. And then this is still Jack reporting to Sophie. This French, slightly rude expression escapes Stephen. And Hassan says, Ah, oh, you speak French, monsieur. And straight away, they realize that they can fix their communication problem. And Jack writes, Man and boy, I have seen some pretty sudden changes of expression, but none quite as instantaneous and thoroughgoing as the Bimbashi's shift from twinkling, full-fed merriment to the most intense and concentrated seriousness when the Arab translated the piece about the French treasure. And in another minute, the whole place was as busy as an overturned beehive with men running in every direction, petty officers bawling, drums beating and trumpets sounding. By dawn, they were all aboard, every last man jack of them, and the breeze was blowing steadily in our teeth. So here we are, Mike. As you said, we've finally caught up with what was this dateline with the Niobe? This is the company's ship, and Jack is on board. Right, right. And as he arrived there, the wind was perfect. And by the time you know the days go by, and he finally finds the Turks, and he convinces them to come along, the wind has shifted, and it leaves them just sitting there motionless in the infernal heat just day after day. Now, Stephen and Martin are pretty happy. They're going up and down in their diving bell, having a grand time. And everybody else is just sweltering. As a matter of fact, Jack's down in his cabin and he hears Moet up through the skylight saying, I love to linger near the leafless wood where cold and shrill the blasts of winter blow. I think he's kind of using his poetry to, to fend off the heat here. And listening to Moet, it makes Jack think about the woods and the moon, which is advancing and the moon keeps advancing while they're not. And every day that passes decreases their odds of capturing the galley. So he starts thinking about, you know, as, as he's going to bed that night, what could I have done differently? How could I have done this so I could have gotten out of here early? And uh, O'Brien writes, the best led mice gang off astray, said one side of his mind. And before the other had quite formulated the answer, yes, but Unlucky leaders are not the men to be entrusted with a delicate, ill-prepared mission. He dropped off, though indeed the notion lingered deep, ready to come back to life again. So, Mike, Jack still seems to be questioning himself. He's questioning his luck, which is a continuing theme. He's dropped in a little Aubreyism, misquoting Robbie Burns about the best laid plans of mice and men. What's going on with this poem. Well, it's interesting. This could easily have been something that O'Brien wrote. But just for fun with Google, we just can't help ourselves. I threw it in and it turns out to be a poem entitled Verses Written on the Seashore. It's by Anonymous. It's in an 1825 collection of poems entitled the poetical commonplace book consisting of an original selection of standard and fugitive poetry, including a few translations and some pieces hitherto unpublished. So a nice, very snappy title. title. Yeah. And I love that. Here's this 1825 book. O'Brien has, I'm certain, found it somewhere in the library. He's pulling, and he might have owned it for that matter. But when I found it, it was actually scanned in on Google Books, and it came from the Harvard College Libraries collection, which a handwritten note on the front page notes was added to the collection 20th July, 1857. So it's great history that we can kind of touch and feel that O'Brien had to kind of travel and get his yeah. hands on that we can do instantaneously, which is amazing. And once again, there's this little line, which really we've got this heat and cool thing going on here, but the full poem is back to Jack's theme about the ravage of time, the ravage of nature on ships and on people. So here's O'Brien working overtime for authenticity. And then by pulling up the corner of this rug, exploring this Easter egg, layers of richness and depth and beauty to the story here. Oh, it's wonderful. And how how deep he's gone into the sources. There's another one coming, though. There's another one coming. So back in the story, Jack is sleeping through all of the ship's noises, but wakes instantly when the wind changes. 
he asks the ship's pilot and the Serang, who's the the, uh, the the Asian head of a of a crew of Laska sailors. He asks them what they make of it, and they say that they think an Egyptian wind may be coming, and they talk about what that might mean. Jack orders the ship to be warped out into the channel in case the wind is going to allow them to proceed. Stephen asks if this wind is the same as the dread simoom. And a simoom is a dry, dust-laden desert wind, especially found in the Arabian Peninsula, which is exactly where we are. And Jack says he's heard that this simoom is very hot. That's not ideal, but if it blows them in the right direction, it can blow as hot as it pleases. And Mike, this dread simoom, we've heard about it before. If we go all the way back to Post Captain, go all the way back to Diana's mad cousin, Mr. Lowndes in Dover, the one who thought he was a teapot. He at some point said, the sea, the sea, where should we be without it? Frizzled to a mere toast, sir, parched, desiccated by the simoom, the dread simoom. Dr. Maturin would like a cup of tea against the desiccation. So this is part of the, the, the crazy shtick of Crazy Cousin Lounge, the dread simoom. And guess what? This is another line from a poem that you can Google and you search and you find even more when you lift the corner of the rug. This is quoting from a poem by a lady called Felicia Hemans. By the way, Cousin Lowndes couldn't have been quoting from it because Cousin Lowndes was in about 1809, 1810, and this poem was published in 1821, so never mind. The poem is called The Caravan in the Desert. And the verse that contains this phrase goes like this. It says, haste. Haste, avert the impending doom, fall prostrate, tis the dread simoom. Bow down your faces, till the blast on its red wing of flame hath passed, far bearing o'er the sandy wave, the viewless angel of the grave. Oh my, this is not particularly fine poetry. They're rhyming couplets. I think Mowat's rhyming couplets are probably even better. But the viewless angel of the grave, there's even more jeopardy. And is it possible? Is it possible that this reference means that our heroes are supposed to heed some kind of a dread warning about sandstorms? Hmm. Let's see. It sure makes sense because, you know, we've now had two verse references, which if followed up are talking about the way that nature can really do us in. And and here we go. And sure enough, this wind that they call the Egyptian, it comes in. It's incredibly dry. It's gusting, these hot gusts through the night. But it is strong enough that by dawn, they're underway. And Jack is up there getting them going. But he's a little concerned because there is what he describes as an orange tawny bar, too thick for cloud, stretching across the horizon. And as he goes down to breakfast, he asks Stephen to ask Hassan about it, you know, thinking he'll be familiar with this. Stephen, of course, is going on and on about how the crew's just illiberally killing scorpions. And and Stephen's sort of defending the scorpions because they only bite when threatened. They're only fatal to those whose hearts are already out of order, and thus probably condemned in any case. And yeah. So, <laughs> and, and he points out, you know, Harvardian should be recovered really in another day or so. So, <laughs> so this is Stephen kind of getting back at Jack's assertion that sharks are all gammon because Jack only knows this because he once jumped in on top of a shark. Stephen's kind of flexing his natural philosopher muscles here and going, I know some things about scorpions that you don't know. And scorpions are all gammon as well. Now, Maybe he's also pushing back on the crew's superstitions, which turned out to be inspired by everyday dewy-eyed creatures of the desert. Are they both right? Or are they both tempting fate on behalf of Mr. Harabedian? Watch this space. Right. Well, this, uh, this wind comes on and on, and a squall strikes the ship, almost laying her on her beam ends. There is dense sand flying everywhere, you know, getting into everything. They can barely see. On deck, the sails threaten to blow away. The spinning wheel, the ship's wheel, breaks the helmsman's arm. And and these Turkish officers have run up on deck and they're in everybody's way. So Jack and his officers are trying to get them below so that they can work the ship before she lays down again. And everybody is either washed or blown overboard. Uh, O'Brien tells us that it takes 20 hours to secure the ship and to work through the sandstorm in what he calls 125 degree heat in the shade. 
So we move from this incredible storm to then even in the midst of the storm, Jack and the crew absolutely exhilarated about using every bit of this wind they can to drive the ship as fast as possible through this very narrow and treacherous waters. They know that they've got to go fast. They can't get anywhere towards the sides. They've got to be very careful about leeway. And so the faster they go, the better they are. Um, They're speeding on so fast, they can't see that they hit this large half-sunk palm tree, almost lose their rudder. And later, they partially ground. They're just sliding across the sand here. They lose a great length of their copper, but they sail on. It's really exciting stuff, isn't it, Mike? I remember this foul weather episode uh, taking up much, much more space in the chapter than it actually does. There's just a couple of pages, really, but he really packs so much in. There's all this very poetical writing about the storm. There's all this really immediate writing about Jack's responses to it and the drama of the grounding and the palm tree. Uh, By the way, on Tom Horn's Cannonade.net website, you can see just how narrow and treacherous the Gulf of Suez. This is the the channel that that, that that goes very narrowly up from the northwest corner of the of the Red Sea. And it's nice as well to have some foul weather to write about. At last, we don't get well. We haven't had that for a little while, and it's noticeable. I think that when the weather gets bad, Patrick O'Brien gives us this really shrunk point of view we don't we're not normally with the crew in the foremast hands we're not normally up above getting the beautiful cinematic overhead when the weather is bad we're either up close with jack and and that's what we are here we're with jack as he's taking a a a break and drinking wine and water through a straw to get the sand out of his mouth right or in bad weather we're often up close with guests and stowaways speaking of which we get to spend time with Stephen and the turks who are down below. Jack goes downstairs, as Stephen would say. Jack goes down below to check on the Turks, and he finds Stephen and Martin sitting with them. They're all quietly cross-legged on cushions. They look dead drunk, and Stephen explains, we are chewing cat. It is said to have a tranquilizing, sedative effect, not unlike that of the coca leaf of Peruvians. And Mike, this is the the tranquilizing effect of co- cocaine. I'm, I'm not sure that anybody from the 1980s would agree that the co- the effect of cocaine is tranquilizing, but never mind. <laughs> the, this substance, cat, is an amphetamine-like substance. It's traditionally chewed in the region to this day. It's the favorite stimulant of Somali warlords and pirates in the Horn of Africa, and um, it's supposed to induce a kind of euphoria. So not a sedative at all. Dickens once wrote that its effect was like that of a strong green tea on Europeans. And I think that's a that's a marketing line that 80s Coke dealers never tried. <laughs> right. right. Oh, man. Well, they're, they're all down here. They're kind of blissed out a little bit. And it, Stephen, uh, translating for Jack, tells him that the, the Bimbashi hopes that Jack is not unduly fatigued and is happy with the journey's progress. And and Jack is happy at the moment. He hopes that the wind holds up because they may be able to make up some of the lost time and might still have a chance to catch the galley. And then Stephen translates the Bimbashi's reply. The Bimbashi says, if it is written that we shall take the galley and become immeasurably rich, then we shall take her. If it is not so written, we shall not. There is nothing that can be done to alter fate and he begs you not to trouble yourself or take unnecessary pains. What is written is written. I see myself sitting in a dorm room in the, <laughs> in the early seventies, going, "You wow, man!" <laughs> but yeah. uh, what's written is written. <laughs> it's right, yeah. Okay, sera, sera. But the uh, I love Jack's reply. Jack looks at Stephen and says. If you can think of a civil way of asking him why, in that case, he brought his men aboard so quickly, tumbling over one another in their haste, pray do so. If not, tell him that it is also written that heaven helps those who help themselves and desire him to stash it. You may also add that while a tone of lofty wisdom may be proper in a philosopher addressing a groundling, it is perhaps less so when a bimbashi is speaking to a post-captain. 
<laughs> yeah. Stephen, <laughs> Stephen massages this in the translation. And then the Bimbashi, O'Brien writes, with a placid smile, says that he was quite content with a soldier's simple allowance and that he'd rather despise wealth than otherwise. And Jack says, well, my friend, I hope this wind does hold a couple of days if only to give you a chance of showing your contempt in practice. Yeah, this is a character from O'Brien's days in the 60s and 70s. I think in terms of the publication, Treason's Harbour is late 70s or even early 80s, so we're quite well. Oh. But this is this is a hark right back to the Halcyon days right. of flower power. So, Mike, maybe, though, but instead of mocking the Bimbashi, maybe we should take a leaf from his spiritual book. Maybe we should contemplate our physical states of mind and the role of fate. Let's take a short break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Before we get back into the text, we wanted to share with you that Mike and I have been guests on another podcast, and maybe some of you might like to take a listen. Mike, tell us more about it. Well, this is Julie Rose, who does these phenomenal podcasts about people who are very passionate about what they do. And she happens to be a fan of The Lover's Hole. Bless you, Julie. Thank you so much. So if you go to lovewhatyoulovepod.com, lovewhatyoulovepod.com, you can listen to the episode where Ian and I talk about Lover's Hole and what makes us so passionate about Patrick O'Brien. Absolutely. And enjoy it. We certainly had a great time talking to Julie and we hope you enjoy listening and maybe catch a few of the other episodes of Love What You Love as well. Anyway, back to the text. Welcome back. I hope you've all got a mellow head now, just like the Bimbashi. We're going to get back to what's happening with the ship rather than what's happening in the uh, in the opium den in the hold. Uh, the wind, we learn, has held through the night and through the next day, but died overnight while Jack was asleep. He says he was not surprised that they were barely moving when he was awoken by Calamy shouting, Islands in sight, because Jack had been having a familiar dream. Mike, we've had this metaphor before. He'd been dreaming that he was riding a fine horse that dwindled and shrank as he rode until his feet were dragging on the ground. And people are looking on in indignation. This is the classic sign of self-doubt for Jack. This is the horse metaphor that continues to plague him. and. It's probably also his mind, his unconscious mind, giving him the coded message that the wind is fading and that maybe this is also a premonition about the mission. Jack starts mm. out riding the finest horse he'd ever ridden and faced setbacks. Mm. Another bit of foreshadowing, maybe. Right, right. Well, they're approaching the Red Sea, coming through these islands, and the men are all trying to scrub this sand out of all, you know, all the nooks and crannies, but Jack stops them pulls every all the hands on deck and raises sails because as they move into the Red Sea, there is, O'Brien writes, not an inconsiderable remaining wind. So uh, he, you know, he puts up essentially everything that the Niobe possesses. This is nice. We, we, you know, we're losing the wind. We get some wind, we're losing the wind. Now we're at least moving out into the Red Sea and, you know, hopefully... Hopefully, things are going to get a little better here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you would think that we're hoping for better times. By the time Stephen finishes in the sick bay and comes on deck looking for Hyrobedian, the wind has died. And Stephen tells them, <laughs> passes on this message from, uh, from Hassan. Um, Stephen says that the Egyptian wind is usually followed by a calm and then the usual northerly breeze sets in again. And Jack and all of the sailors on board would rather be rich than poor, and they're therefore very glad to hear this. And everyone's spirits are rising until Jack lasts how long this calm usually lasts. Yet more spiritual detachment. Two or three days, we learn. But Hassan observed it was all in God's hands. So Jack, maybe just casting about for something to think about other than fatalism, <laughs> wonders what Mr. Harabedian's up to. He's seen him skipping across the deck and calls out to him just as Harabedian jumps into the water swims aft and comes up laughing, looking at them on the quarter deck. And Mike, this is one of those really memorable moments in the canon. Here it comes. Hyrobedian's face 
jerks up. There's a dark form beneath him. Harabedian screams and is shaken, we are told, with inconceivable ferocity before vanishing below in a cloud of red as five sharks tear him apart and we see the fins of more sharks moving in. And this is really unsettling. It's unsettling because it it comes up so quickly and has described in such a matter-of-fact way, which is exactly how O'Brien often gives us these really profoundly chilling moments. Um, I think it's meant to unsettle us just as it unsettles the crew. You know, we've been getting used to Hyrobedian and we'd learn to like him, but we, we get more. The noon observation is carried on mechanically, we learn. The hands are piped to dinner. No one has an appetite. The men ask Jack if they can serve out the sharks using hooks and tackle. And he objects because the poor man Harabedian is still in their bellies. It's very, very grim. Jack suggests that they can shoot the sharks at small arms practice because that can't do any harm. And Stephen thinks that Jack doesn't look well and suggests drawing off some blood just to keep the blood imagery going in our minds. Jack says he doesn't want to see any more blood that day. He can't get Harabedian out of his mind. And we learn that Stephen had gone through Harabedian's belongings, as Jack had requested, couldn't find the direction for a family address. He did, however, find a box with a false bottom and Jack's chelenk inside. Oh, what a damn thing, cried Jack. I am so sorry. Poor fellow. And they walk back up on deck to see how much fuller the moon is. It's surprising that Jack didn't have a stronger reaction to learning that his chilenk had been stolen, uh, or even a stronger reaction to the deception that we'd all uh, learned to esteem Harabedian, and in fact, he was a thief or maybe worse. But Jack very generously is just saddened by this, and he's caring, to his credit, you know, he's caring more about people than about things. And we've had this great reversal Hyrobedian, who we esteemed, is gone really, really quickly and suddenly. We learn that he's a thief and maybe also a spy. It's unsettling to us that, and to Jack, that we learn that sharks aren't gammon after all. And Jack's favorite and familiar element, the sea, is dangerous in ways that he hadn't supposed. And the bloodshed caused by nature seems so much more chilling, at least to the crew, than blood that's shed in battle. So I'm, Mike, I've got hairs standing up here. This is really, really uneasy writing. It's a really unsettling episode. Yeah, it really, I, I, I had the same reaction. It's just kind of, you know, we're like wind, no wind, wind, no wind, sand. You're like, oh my God, this incredible shark attack so vividly, but succinctly and shortly just happens kind of out of out of nowhere. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, they're there, everybody's so upset, and to add to their misery, they just continue to remain becalmed. The Bimbashi's cot runs out, and O'Brien writes his philosophy with it, so he's he's no longer <laughs> the laid-back dude that we saw a little while ago. He has two of his men severely beaten with rods in the Turkish manner, writes O'Brien. And despite the incredible severity of the beating, the men hardly make a sound, and the other Turks just kind of stand around and watch it. You know, one guy's carried off unconscious, another one's bleeding from the mouth and everywhere else, and they're just okay. And some of the surprises believe that the Turks, what they call bloody, well-born punishment, has earned the ship her relief, the small breeze that sprang up almost as soon as the deck had been cleaned. However, it's still a very little breeze, and it's dead aft. So, you know, O'Brien tells us they probably would have had to have a lot more people beaten to get the breeze they need if that, what the surprises believed, was true. But Jack, knowing there's only light airs, sets the sails which will benefit from this breeze. And, and he tries to explain to Stephen, you know, setting more sails doesn't mean you're going to go faster, that, in fact, some yeah. of the sails would become the sails in front of them. But he notices that in, in addition to Stephen's concern about the sales, that Hassan and the Turkish officers are looking very unfriendly and standoffish in the midst of this. And later, Stephen comes up to Jack and explains that he's only the messenger. He's finally agreed after being browbeaten pretty hard to deliver a message to Jack. And he tells him that Hassan suspects that the Egyptians 
have offered Jack a great reward not to capture the galley that, you know, that in fact they think for this bribe, he's dragging his feet. You know, he reports after all that he had seen Harabedian speaking with messengers from Mamet Ali. So now we're sorting, as you mentioned, Ian, to see that, ah, some people were observing contact between Harabedian and, and the enemy. So these messengers running back and forth and Hassan and the Bimbashi believe that Clearly, it you know it stands to reason that if Jack would raise more sails, they would go faster, which would allow them to capture the galley. So Stephen brings Hassan's proposal that Jack accept an even greater sum from him, raise the sails, and press on to capture the galley. And Jack is you know kind of he doesn't quite know what to do with all this, and he says you know he asked Stephen you know if I explain to them more about the working of the sales, is it going to help? And Stephen says no, none of it will do any good. So Jack says he'll just have to put up with their mumpishness, <laughs> mumpishness meaning sulky or silent or sullen. You and I have talked about this so many times. And a Google engram shows us that the mumpishness is. Peak use was in 1815. O'Brien nails it again. Although, interestingly, there's another peak again in 1929, but it looks to be mostly dictionaries. (laughs) 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 Oh, it's brilliant. And by the way, poor old Jack. I mean, back ashore in Malta, he has the reputation for for being engaged in an affair with Laura Fielding, and he's... Well, he's done a little to earn it, but he's done very little in practice to earn his reputation. Now he's being accused of being a, a participant in corruption, and he's done nothing to deserve that either. So his reputation is being kind of beaten on a little bit here. So poor fellow. Anyway, overnight, once again, the wind changes, and this almost seems to prove the contrary. When Hassan and the Bibashi come up in the morning, they find that all the sails are set, and it says in the text, they exchange discreet but exceedingly knowing glances, and they're much nicer to Jack. And Jack simply bows, and I can imagine the forbearance, and climbs to the main top so as to give their suppositions no countenance. Maybe, though, <laughs> maybe, though, his uh, his bow was like a nod and a wink to let them believe that their, their, their bribe offer had been accepted. Anyway, they're happy in their belief that cutting Jack in on the treasure has motivated him to put the sails up. In actual fact, it's the changing of the wind that has allowed Jack to put the sails up. It's all come a little bit late, though. Despite the increased speed, when they reach Mubara, it's 17 days after the full of the moon, two days late. But there's still a remote possibility that the galley has not passed. So the officers and crew, all of them except for Stephen and Martin, are on deck before dawn watching and listening. Jack spends some time wandering about the best course for his son, for young George, who's all the way back in England. We haven't heard about Sophie and the children for a while. Young George must be getting to the age where Jack can start to think about his naval future. And he's thinking about, can he send him to school? Can he put him aboard ship with one of his friends? And while he's thinking about his kids, the youngster Calamy reports hearing something. And everyone is silent. And it's the sound of the rower's song. It's confirmed by Hassan and confirmed by the Sarang. They're hearing the noise of the chant of the rowers aboard the galley. Even after the sun rises, they still don't see it. But finally, when the mist clears, they see her far ahead, even further ahead than Jack was expecting, on the far side of the channel at the edge of the coral reef. And Mike, this is the moment where the cogs can finally slip into place, right there. They've found it. They've managed to get there just on time. They slip the cable and they're straight into Jack Aubrey false flag mode. They think, well, okay, we're going to make ourselves look like a merchantman heading for Mubara. We'll just kind of slide up close to them and maybe not. Maybe their deception hasn't worked because seeing the Niobe, the rowers stop singing and appear to row faster. Yeah, it's it's interesting. They they're taking off, and then Jack starts doing as as we've often read these calculations in his mind. You know, can yeah. I catch her? How fast is she going to be? How fast can I get the Niobe to go? Um, wait, wait. There's this inlet coming up. If I'm chasing her, she's going to be able to make the inlet, but I won't. I won't be able to weather it. Um, and they notice that the galley is not taking their eyes off the Niobe. 
Um, Stephen and Martin, of course, are nonplussed. They're comparing the galley to others of antiquity and having side conversations. But Stephen does worry that if the galley makes it through the inlet, gets past there and into the harbor before they can catch her, all the element of surprise will be lost. Now, Jack's thinking to himself, you know, they seem to be a little alarmed, but he's waiting for all these French officers to run out and start <laughs> ordering people around, but he doesn't see any. And then he thinks, well, maybe, you know, maybe they just spooked a little bit. Maybe he should stand out to sea so as not to spook them anymore. And then later he'll come sailing into the harbor under French colors, take the galley, take the town, return home victorious. But the thought enters his mind. He can kind of hear the commander in chief saying, speed is the essence of attack. And so he raises his sails. And when the galley sees this, they take off. So Jack now knows he absolutely has to catch her before she turns into the inlet and then gets to the harbor. So there, you know, the race is on. <laughs> it is. And it reminded me a little bit of how he had the words of Admiral Hart ringing in his ear back in the Ionian mission about not firing first. So and I'm sort of one worrying on his behalf, is he going to get misled by his kind of close attention to the Admiral? But it all seems to unfold in the kind of classic Jack Aubrey Cochrane sort of style. They begin to gain on the chase. Jack thinks he sees that the rowers are tiring and just in time, spots that there's a passage in the reef ahead that's too narrow for the Niobe that the galley can escape through. And just in time, orders the gunner to put a ball across her bows, carefully, of course, not to sink her. The gunner, who is able to put all of his professional skill on the line and are not willing to risk his share of 5,000 purses, fires dead true. The galley turns quickly seems like Jack has persuaded her not to take the passage. So the galley and the Niobe continue on. The Niobe gains until she's at point-blank range. And now and now Jack starts to realise what might be going on. His excitement fades, and he recalls the dream of the shrinking horse. He starts to doubt the situation. Why exactly had the galley run at the sight of just an ordinary merchantman? Why exactly had she given up so easily on the inlet and now he thinks that maybe her speed doesn't correspond to the thrashing of the oars and he notices the line running from the stern of the galley into her wake. And this is a ruse that Jack has used himself. He sees the line and he calls over Williamson and Calamy and points out the trick that he's used himself so often. He explains that lame ducks, mangling his poetry a little bit here, he explains that lame ducks pull the wool over your eyes. And he says, the galley's using a drag sail to keep the Niobe chasing her. They mean, he says, to lead us into a knacker's yard. And that is why I'm going to sink her. Whoa. Well, he opens up his gun ports and now the galley knows that uh, the game is up. So they yeah. cut the drag sail. They start rowing faster. And Hassan is begging Jack, don't sink her. Don't lose the treasure. And Jack explains to him that they're really not there for the treasure. They're there to take the island of Mubara. You know, they're not pirateers. They're not there just to get rich. And, and he realizes that they can now no longer hope to catch her. So he has the gunner fire away. And with one shot, he sinks the galley. And everyone, you know, the entire crew appreciates what an incredible shot he's taken. But they're absolutely sobered by the loss of this treasure. And just at that time, a completely unsuspected shore battery opens up on the Niobe, but the Niobe is just short of their range. So had they chased the galley and continued to chase her, they would have been directly in range in this battery that they didn't even know existed here. They do sail over to the galley because she's sitting not that deep and her pennant is actually still above the water. And, and Moet suggests that they take the pennant, you know, at least they'll have that. And Jack thinks uh, it's time to anchor anyways, because we've got to plan our attack on the island. So they anchor there over the galley and, and pull that pennant on board. So poor old Jack again, not only is, is he misunderstood at every turn by Hassan, He's invested all of this effort and smart decision-making and tactics and got nothing for it. And he's even discovered that there's a battery there that's now trained on him. And he's, he's still philosophical about it, I think, but he's kind of lamenting his bad luck. He remarks, 
The sight of 5,000 purses no more than 10 fathoms under our keel makes me almost regret my virtue. And of course, he means his virtue in making the tactically right decision to sink the galley rather than try to take her while she was still afloat. And the regret is even greater because the water is so clear under the Nibi that they can see the galley. Now, Stephen doesn't quite get how Jack's action was virtuous. They couldn't catch the galley anyway. But Jack says, well, maybe later we could have gotten her in the harbour. You know, in any naval situation, I think Jack thinks he's resourceful enough to find his way through. Stephen says that the batteries surely would have sunk the Nibi. And Jack says, well, actually, I, I didn't know that at the time that I sunk her. So you're saying I, I was being virtuous, genuinely virtuous in choosing to sink her when I did. He had only been thinking about the mission's success and he had deliberately, in his eyes, thrown away a fortune. And he says, slightly tongue in cheek, he says he's amazed at his own magnanimity. And meanwhile, meanwhile, Killick, ever the sarcastic one, mocks him from behind and announces that Mr. Martin has arrived. And Jack goes on and tells Martin, it's a whimsical situation with a crew of paupers floating over a fortune. And then Mike, Stephen makes a remark that almost seems like he's putting a foot wrong. Yeah, we get this. The, the Reverend Martin has come in and Stephen says, I am a urinator. And Jack, you know, is taken aback and protests this bad language in front of this man of the cloth. And Stephen replies, it is well known that I am a urinator, and in recent hours, I felt a great moral pressure on me to dive. We go on to learn that while nobody has suggested this directly to Stephen, especially after what happened to Harabedian, everyone has repeatedly, when they see Stephen, been glancing at his diving bell. And <laughs> Brian writes, glances as eloquent as those of a dog. <laughs> and so we all know. Uh, about those puppy eyes. They're they're hard to resist, as, as the dog said. No, no, Dad, I'm looking at the treats. That's what I want. I don't want you to pet me. I want you to give me one of those. So Stephen tells Jack he's got a plan. He wants to go down in the diving bell, attach hooks to the galley's deck, break open the floorboards, and bring up the cargo. He just needs a mate, a companion, a helper. And Martin says that he too is a urinator and volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm sure Jack is still a little flabbergasted about all these urinators aboard. And and it was funny because just this week, you know, the week that we're recording this, this topic was on the one of the Facebook canon sites, either Patrick O'Brien or the Aubrey Matron. Appreciation Society, and and they rightly pointed out in one of the uh, respondents that a urinator is Latin for one who dives underwater for something. That was the original meaning before it became what we now use it for, <laughs> the passing of water. <laughs> right? uh, peak usage, by the way, 1800, and then another peak in 1921. So it's very, very odd that we have these you know 20s peaks, but but that one actually more in some personal letters, <laughs> but not not in the uh, the dictionary. So so this Latin, they, they differ slightly. One is the noun usage, one is the verb usage. So O'Brien comes by his joke, honestly, but it's easy to see how it might get lost on us today. For instance, the Urban Dictionary defines urinator as the person who needs to pee or pees most often. So you know, on the road trip, every two hours we had to stop for Kevin, the urinator. Now, <laughs> O'Brien doesn't tell us <laughs> who the urinator on the Niobe is, other than we have these two divers, right? Right, although I think we did get a shot of somebody in the heads uh, in the Master and Commander movie. So, <laughs> so maybe we know. Right. Maybe it's, that's the urinator. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's really funny dialogue. And Mike, I, I was wondering if there's a difference between the experience here between audiobook listeners and book readers because maybe if you read the book you might either hear the word pronounced urinator or you might be all latin and scholarly and pronounce the word to yourself urinator and that would kind of spoil the pun <laughs> but i think pa patrick toll reads it like urine right so we get the full force oh, of the joke yeah yeah I, I i was like what what did he just say <laughs> interestingly now, now that the bell makes take center stage we've got two payoffs in this chapter we've got two two Chekhov implements that were raised earlier in the book that have now been used um Chekhov's shark appeared back in about chapter two and Chekhov's diving bell I think as early as chapter one has now made its appearance and it's going to be used 
Jack's really worried about the idea of using the diving bell. He tells Stephen and Martin to think of poor Hyrebedian. Um, don't do it, he's basically saying. Stephen says that they're not going to go outside the bell and that he has a plan for dissuading sharks for, from coming in with an iron prong or a horse pistol, which I'm not entirely convinced with. And Killick, he's right there. That's right, says Killick, and drops a dish to cover the fact that he's been intervening and earwigging on the conversation. Right. And uh, and we get this great description. On going below to attend the captain's dinner, Stephen had left a dismal deck full of tired, deeply disappointed men, gasping hot, apt to quarrel with one another and with the Turks. He returned to find sunny faces, affectionate looks, a holiday atmosphere, laughter fore and aft, his bell beautifully put together, ready to be swung clear of the rail and lowered, its glass newly polished, and a series of beckets within held six loaded pistols and two boarding pikes, while a variety of hooks, tackles, lines and ropes lay neatly coiled upon the bench. But the laughter stopped, and the mood changed entirely when what had been in prospect became immediate reality. Should you not like to wait until the evening, sir? asked Bondon, as Stephen was preparing to get into the bell, and it was clear from their serious, concerned faces that he was speaking for a good many of the crew. Nonsense, replied Stephen. I love how O'Brien writes this scene, and he demonstrates that nothing is confidential on a ship as small as the Niobe. <laughs> Everybody already knows the conversation, already has everything prepared. And I also love Bondin's concern. As much as he wants the treasure, he's like, no, 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 don't don't go quite yet. Let's wait till evening, fewer sharks and everything. You know, and the entire crew's concern for Stephen. Well, everyone does all they can to take care of Stephen and Martin and the bell and making sure their air is well supplied. 20 men are lining the side with muskets, you know, watching for sharks. But it, it, on the way down, the first shark, 35 to 40 feet long, comes along, but it's too far down to shoot. But Stephen releases that little cock at the top of the bell and the, and the air whooshing up, you know, scares them off. Um, now, they're down there. And it's funny, as they're going down, Stephen and Martin are describing all the wildlife and the nature they see. They're loving all this. And Jack and the crew upstairs, you know, are wondering what in the world is taking so long. But the real trouble is that neither Martin or Stephen is very good with the ropes. And Stephen, in particular, is having trouble here with the ropes and the hook and the tackle. And and Martin saying, you know, well, we could send a note upstairs and, and they'll send something down. And Stephen really doesn't want to let on to them that he is, quote unquote, not the complete seaman, so, as, as if nobody knew. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but finally, they give up and they send a note on the slate, you know, with the lead pencil. Uh, and a foolproof hook is sent down. It's attached, and then the crew pulls, and the galley's deck comes apart very nicely, floats up to the surface. And oh, wondrously, Stephen sees all these rectangular chests lined up below in the galley. Uh, they retrieve one of them. Stephen and Martin are trying to tie a rope around this really heavy chest. But as the crew pulls it up, the knot slips just as it gets above the waterline and the chest falls out, heads straight down for the diving bell's glass window. And Jack is thinking, oh my gosh, if it cracks that window, Stephen and Martin are dished. But it just misses it, bounces off. And Jack is, you know, he's kind of over it. He orders the bell to be raised immediately. He says, I'm going to go down myself and make sure I can fasten these ropes. They come up. They're a little bit apologetic. And Jack's like, no, 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 no. You know, you guys did a great job. Um, they congratulate him. The crew is cheering. And as Jack takes Martin's place, he says, every man to his trade, you know, and the cook to the foresheet. The cook to the foresheet. What the that sounds like naval people ought to be familiar with that saying. Where does that come from? Well, it's it's funny. I wondered the same thing. The cook to the foresheet. And, and, you know, in the story, everybody's pounding the cook on the back as they say that. And it turns out, just as you say, Ian, there's an old sailor's saw. It goes ship shape and Bristol fashion, the captain on the poop and the cook to the foresheet. And it turns out that on these small vessels, it was it was not unusual for the cook to let go one sheet run through the galley, and then haul away on the other as the foreyards came around. And, and that huh. I found that great little bit of wisdom in a book called Hen Frigates, 
Passion and Peril, 19th Century Women at Sea by Joan Druitt. Oh, thank you, Joan. <laughs> really yeah, nice. Great work us. from Joan. Well done. Right. Her. It's really great. Again, just a little a little bit of something for us to dig into. Um, I love then more Jeopardy for Jack. We've gone from backslapping and hilarity on the deck to immediate first person kind of terror for Jack because it seems like he's claustrophobic. I don't think we've heard before of Jack having a problem with enclosed spaces, but Brian writes that he's really directly struggling against his urge, the very, very strong urge to escape from this bell as it's on its way down. They bring up one of the chests and they're on their way back up to get iron cask slings to bring up the rest. And everybody cheers them as they gather round. The carpenter opens this one chest and inside, painted white on a dull grey block of metal, are the words, Merde à celui qui le lit. And Stephen translates it roughly as, whoever reads this is a fool. And even those of us who only remember a few words of French knows that that's a very generous <laughs> mistranslation. Davis, awkward Davis, sums up the situation. It's a f***ing pig of lead! And they throw the fake treasure, the lead bar, overboard. Meanwhile, just to, to complete the anticlimactic letdown, <laughs> Rowan brings aboard a local fisherman and thereafter buying the, the, his catch for the evening meal. And Jack hopes that the fisherman can provide intelligence to help plan the Turks' invasion. But Mike, the intelligence is even more of an anticlimax. It is. You know, Stephen comes back to Jack to report what they've learned. And what they learned from this fisherman is that the French, in fact, have been there for over a month. This whole thing was a story, uh, you know, to kind of rope the Niobe in. The French had already built these new batteries. There's now absolutely no possibility for them to land on the island. Uh, and this galley has been rowing up the channel every day back down again every night and all the local fishermen have been told that it carries great quantities of silver so it appears that they transported the original silver kept those boxes filled them with lead to trap the niobe here ah, we have been done brown said jack what flats we must look and Stephen says, well, perhaps one should look for such a result when an expedition has been so much talked of as this was, said Stephen. But even so, I'm surprised at the precision of their intelligence. Oh, man. So all of Jack's decisiveness and his decision making and his seamanship and his magnanimity and his courage in the face of claustrophobia, all of this excellent execution on Jack's part, all for nothing. It's a massive anticlimax. We've really, once again, in true Patrick O'Brien style, we've had all of this um, excitement and potential undercut. And we're still, what, only just over halfway through the book. So Mike, here we are at the end of chapter six. Stephen's talking about the precision of their intelligence. Was this the attempt that Ray and Lesue were talking about as killing two birds with one stone? Was this their attempt to have Stephen and Jack taken care of? If so, that's failed, but then so is the mission. But what's going on back in Malta? What's going to happen when Jack and Stephen return? How is the commander-in-chief going to react to this botched mission? I wonder what Ray and, and Lesue have in store for them and for Laura Fielding. And is this the, the harboring treason or is there more to come? And for me, will Stephen and his diving bell continue their partnership as we move on? Well, Mike, there's only one way to find out. I think it's time for more. What do you say to another chapter of Patrick O'Brien? Ah, with all my heart. Let's take a short break. 
Om. 